Not yet. Uh, I am uh, the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs, Jenna Bednar, and I'm just delighted to see such a lovely turnout on such a drippy day. A uh, drippy day like this, tell us spring is coming, so it's all right. Um, so uh, it's just absolutely my pleasure to welcome you to this final panel of the Dean's Symposium. Um, and I hope that you've been able to attend some of the other sessions because they've been marvelous. I, before I uh, get into introductions, I will note that we have one missing member of the panel whose plane has just landed because, again, back to the weather stuff, um, it was delayed a bit. So uh, Steve will be joining us as soon as he can, and in a second I'll tell you a little bit more about, uh, about Steve. And this will be his chair. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so uh, today we are talking and for the whole afternoon, because I hope that uh, many of you are staying uh, uh, for this uh, later this afternoon when we hear from Stacey Abrams. But today we're talking about democracy, or the state of democracy around the world. And, you know, this is an exciting year. Uh, the most significant elections embracing 70 countries, eight of the 10 most populous uh, countries, 20 that will take place on the African continent, 2 billion people will vote in 2024, so, representing more than 60% of the global gross domestic product, which is a funny way of talking about people. Um, and there must have been something wrong with my mic. So here we are. Uh, uh, so, um, and we won't see this same confluence in the opportunity for democratic participation again until 2048. So this should be a moment of celebration. And yet, we're worried. It's a moment of worry. Worry about the health and strength and, uh, of democracy and our commitment to it. And so just a couple of things. Uh, um, uh, the Atlantic Council had a, a recent meeting um, that summed up some of the most salient points. Uh, the Financial Times calls this year the most intense and cacophonous 12 months of democracy since the idea was minted more than 2,500 years ago. Foreign policy says, this coming year you will see a global battle between democracy and autocracy, literally at the polls. Um, and so we have a sense that democracy is on the defensive. But according to Freedom House, democracies need to counteract a recession in undemocratic rights and freedoms that's been underway globally since 2006. So to help us think about these issues, uh, we have an outstanding panel. And let me just tell you a little bit about them, including our uh, so far empty chair. In fact, the empty chair is where I'll start. Steve Biggin, uh, he's been a ta he's a deep friend of the Ford School and of the University of Michigan. Uh, he has served as a Towsley policymaker in residence here at the Ford School. He's currently a board member of the National Endowment uh, for Democracy. He has more than three decades of international affairs experience in government and the private sector, including in the Department of State, the White House, and the United States Congress. In 2021, he concluded his most recent uh, government service as the U.S. Deputy Secretary of State. Um, Importantly, he's also a graduate of the University of Michigan, where he was awarded a bachelor's degree in political science and the Russian language. So we will 
welcome him as soon as he can get here from the airport. Uh, so Dave Carroll comes to us from the Carter Center, where he leads the Carter's, uh, the Center's initiative on developing standards and best practices in international election observation. He's managed or participated in more than 70 Carter Center projects to strengthen democracy and electoral processes around the globe in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. And then my colleague, my dear colleague, Ambassador Susan Page, uh, is uh, a Ford School professor of practice. Uh, although she was due to moderate the discussion, because this is how we roll at Ford, we're ready for anything. She's actually way overqualified to join as a panelist. Uh, but So let me tell you a little bit about her uh, qualifications for the few of you who don't know her yet. Uh, she served also in the U.S. Department of State, the U.S. Agency for International Development, the United Nations, and non-governmental organizations in senior roles for decades across East, Central, and Southern Africa, and in Haiti and Nepal. She was the first U.S. ambassador to the Republic of South Sudan and served as assistant uh, secretary general of the United, State, uh, United Nations in Haiti. So I want to, uh, before we launch, and I'm going to be asking the questions, um, uh, I would like to thank our co-sponsors, the Wiser Diplomacy Center and the International Policy Center, as well as our media partner, Detroit Public Television. And uh, once the panel has spoken for a little while, we're going to open it up to audience questions. Uh, if you're watching online, please click on uh, the web page. If you're here in the room, uh, please use those QR codes. I think they're um, on those little, uh, that's a pretty deep maize color, but the maize colored uh, uh, pieces of paper uh, that are roaming around on the tables. And then my colleagues, Nayib, Ali, and uh, Basma, and Mom will moder uh, moderate those questions. OK. Uh, and if you're posting to social media, uh, please use at Ford School, um, uh, Ford School, all one word, and hashtag Dean Symposium. Uh, and that is with two S's. As you type it out, you'll see what I mean. All right. Thank you very much. And let me just sit for a second and grab the questions, and we'll get started. Okay, so at this moment, I think I'll just turn to you, uh, David, if you want to just maybe share some of your thoughts about the state of democracy worldwide. Happy to do that. And assuming that the microphone's working? No, yeah? no. no. no? Okay. Okay. Is that better? No. no. Oh, yes? Uh, no? Sorry. Hard to say. Let's see. I'll keep talking and tell me if it's getting any better. It sounds amplified. I'm amplified. <laughs> <laughs> How about now? Can you hear me pretty good? Yeah, that sounds good? Okay, I see a lot of nodding heads. Okay, I'm going to put this back in. So, um, your question was say just, something about the state of democracy. Yeah, right? just, so, just. Uh, yeah. So, um, clearly it's, it's a very important, challenging moment as has been laid out in, in, in the introduction. But from where I sit, having been doing this work for more than 30 years, it's actually something that's been going on for a good 10 or 15 years. But I think it's, it is kind of reaching more important breaking points or you know, serious crossroads. And it's a sense that more and more countries in the world uh, are affected. But if you look at the indices that track uh, democracy and the state of the democracy of, around the world, the varieties of democracy and uh, scoring and the Freedom House scoring, You'll see that for 15 or 20 years, there's been kind of a leveling off of what had been progress for 30 years or so from the 70s. It's leveled, and it's starting to decline in the last 10 or 15 years. You know, kind of the slow, gradual decline. Not a significant decline, but, a mar but something that you can see. So progress toward democracy that had been happening for a very, very long time is in trouble. There's no doubt about that. Uh, and if I was to kind of anticipate some of the things we'll be talking about and I try to say, you, know, you want to know why and should be, what can be done about it, I'll at least try to say a few things about what I think is why. And the first is um, global political change. So just, you know, when I was a graduate student in the 
early 80s, I remember reading about you know, global declines and shifts in power balances, and, and in my life I'd never seen those. I thought, what are they talking about? This, uh, what does that even look like? Now I know what it looks like. Uh, there's global political change. We're moving from what had been a very stable, bipolar world of two superpowers to a context where there's you know, at least a third superpower and many other middle powers, nuclear weapons, proliferation. It's a, we're entering a period of significant political instability. That's happening. Second, uh, I would say economic inequality uh, and um, uh, economic development, and you know, however you want to put those together. Your economics <coughs> professors can say a lot more about them. But clearly, in societies across the world, we're not addressing inequality, inequality sufficiently. And the economic development is, has been challenging. The third thing that I would point to is the cluster of media, uh, traditional media, the decline of traditional media, and the rise of social media and the information environment, the effects those have on the information environment and the information that people receive and hear and believe and the complications that's introducing to how we as societies deal with all of that. So I would say those are the things that concern me and it's mm -hmm. uh, in countries all around the world. And well, I should say, uh, I work at the Carter Center. I've been working on elections for more than 30 years. And it's only been in the last four years or so that the Carter Center has said we should be thinking about working inside the US. And it was a difficult decision for the Carter Center to work on political issues in our home country. When we work internationally, we are automatically seen as a non-biased, non-partisan entity. And President Carter is highly respected around the world. We were concerned of having a former Democratic president working on political issues in the US and how that would be perceived. And we've been pleasantly surprised that you know, so far, people think it's important for us to work on these issues. But it, it, it was a difficult decision for the Carter Center to say we are going to work on these issues in the US. And it's a reflection of our assessment and conclusion that we're entering a very, very difficult space uh, in this country in this time. Susan, before I get into these questions, so what's on your mind when you think about democracy globally? Well, since I was supposed to be asking the questions, um, <laughs> I have to shift my hat a little bit, but um, I think one of the biggest issues is something that came up at the last panel, um, and David has really just laid it out, which is the global inequality, but within every society. And we often like to think of countries, even in the US, or groups of people as a monolith, and that's unfortunately very misguided. And so when I think about the countries that I've worked the most on throughout my career, mostly in Africa, but some elsewhere like Haiti, um, we're not talking about solutions for those countries in quite the same way or dedicating as much attention to them. Um, and we're questioning, well, why are these countries having coups? Um, and a large part of it is because they're not seeing democracy working for them. Mm -hmm. They are the providers of all of this wealth that is going out, um, but receiving very little in return. That's not to say that there isn't also bad management, mismanagement, interference by foreign powers, including the United States. But um, I think the, the problem really is, well, why would they overthrow this government that's been supposedly democratically elected? But as we all know, elections are not the only indicator of democracy. Susan just brought up um, where I was, uh, we're definitely going to be going in, in um, the upcoming few questions, which is really about the public and the public's commitment to democracy. Um, and so, David, I just thought, you know, we've been hearing this word backsliding, democratic backsliding a lot. Um, and uh, I'm wondering whether that is consistent with what you're seeing. It sounds like it was from your opening remarks, mm -hmm. but if you maybe want to tie it to, 
um, the public's commitment to democracy in the way that Susan has just invited us to think about it. Sure. Um, yeah, there is some debate in the academic literature about exactly how to measure and different schemes to track this, but I don't think there's much doubt that we are experiencing some backsliding, and certainly different countries are moving in different ways. So there are countries that are making progress. Some of them are ones that had been declining, and they've, they've turned it around. Uh, so that's you know a little bit of a mixed bag. But there are pretty clearly more countries declining on democracy scores than, than rising. So I, th I, think, I don't think there's too much significant debate about whether or not backsliding is occurring. It's more about how much and how to measure it and how to understand it. Um, and you said link it to? Well, to the public support. And by the way, can you all hear me without the mic? I, I might be double amplified. All right. Um, to public support, that is, is, is that the source of backsliding? It's just, you know, in the oh, sense no, that I Susan see, was I describing, yeah. democracy, pe there, people are saying democracy isn't working for me. Yeah. And so it's the lack of yeah. public commitment to it that's yeah. causing yeah. democracy to decline. I, I think there's multiple things, but I think that's definitely a, bi a big part of it. I mean, people are not seeing democracies satisfy their needs, right? So democracies are not doing a good enough job. Uh, but there is, you know, all these other, you know, other factors generally, you know, economic success, the information environment is, I think, a very, very big, important one. And just the, you know, political uh, relations between countries adds stress to it. Yeah. Um, now, so when we look at some different countries like uh, Brazil, France, India, Italy, Tunisia, Uganda, um, not to mention, of course, the United States and many other nations, it seems like leaders are using um, certain like hot topics like immigration, religion, crime, identity to vilify the other. Right, to divide us, um, particular groups of people as a means to appealing to voters, um, to voters' fears, or, um, or to justify the usurpation of people's rights and freedoms as long as they are in this category of the other. Um, so I'd, I'd like to invite each of you to, to think a little bit about this. And in particular, should we be thinking about this as a form of populism or nativism? Would you? Or would you like me to? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, are you sure? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I mean, I, th I think there's definitely elements of populism and nativism, and there's you know an overlap between those. A little bit more of you know who's being targeted in, in those two concepts, but uh, you know nativism and being more the the people outside your country or the the immigrants, those who are different from you, or is, are, who are the ones who are somehow to be blamed. And populism, it's more of an economic uh, focus. But there's an overlap. And both of those, I think, are elements and symptomatic of how people are reacting to these pressures. You know, they're, they're, you're needing someone to blame. You're needing someone to be moving ahead of. And it's a reflection of the economic and the political distress that our societies are facing. I think, you know, fundamentally, at the end of the day, that's how I look at it. Yeah, I would just add, I mean, I think that's right. Um, the additional factor is that people are honing in on people's fears and also what works in order to get them elected. And sure. people universally are afraid of change, all of us. You know, we don't like change. We don't know what that is going to portend. And so the blame, being able to see someone as worse off than you are, is an important kind of psychological way that we think of ourselves. But also, this inequality is really causing a lot of stress. And when people think about these new people coming in, it doesn't take much to then go that extra step and vilify them mm -hmm. and say, well, they're the reason that I'm losing out. Sure. It's someone else's fault. Um, it's nothing to do with me. But some of that is particularly unique to the United States and the way that it's partly capitalism, but it's, it's this, always this mechanism of pull, you up from, you know, pull yourself up from your own bootstraps. Well, you know, if you don't have any shoes, you don't have any bootstraps to pull up. Um, and so I think that that is not necessarily the way that people see things 
in other parts of the world that have a much more a much stronger commitment to working together and you know, there's a Swahili word Harambe you know it's that togetherness that is is really important and capitalism doesn't like that you know it's very much individualism and that's kind of coming home to roost where we don't have a lot of those jobs that provided a good wage um, and so a lot of people are struggling and the people who have long been at the top don't particularly want to share that with anyone else but they're using that rhetoric as a way to upset the apple cart. That's a really interesting and David I, I hope you don't mind if I just no. follow up with mm -hmm. um, Susan just raised that maybe it, it, she's laid out a hypothesis for us, right? That it's even worse in the United States because of our culture of, of individuality or self-reliance. Um, and does this ring true to you? And is this part of, uh, you know, the Carter Center as you're thinking about, as you are moving mm -hmm. into um, the United States, is that part of the way that you're thinking about it, the Carter Center? I mean, I, I agree with the analysis. Um, you know, we're not in the way that we're structuring our programming that's not a, a very specific focus of what we're dealing with but I certainly think it's clearly part of the underlying explanation of you know some of the forces at work I, I, no doubt about that that it's just it, it, that's amplifying the problem For so sure. all that's threatening democracy globally there's a cultural factor that's making it maybe even worse mm -hmm. except that it's not necessarily true ah. but that is the language that we have always used. It's individualism, as if there are no programs that the government has provided, that there are no social safety nets, as if everything has actually been accomplished by individuals all along, which of course is not the case. But the ideology persists exactly. in, in, our, in our national exactly. self story. Exactly, yeah. and that's not necessarily yeah. Yeah. the self story elsewhere. And if it's our narrative, it's something that our politicians can play off yes. of for their for own sure. game. Yes. Oh, so interesting. All right. Um, so, I mean, actually, the next thing that, that we had planned to talk about kind of is a continuation of this. Some of the underlying conditions that are causing these changes um, and uh, what's appealing to citizens. So. Uh, I don't want to take you outside of the United States because it's you know it's so much on our minds, but maybe put it in contrast with what you're seeing elsewhere as kind of driving um, this uncertainty about democracy. Uh, yeah, I mean, again, I think that people are starting to rise up, and part of it is media. Uh, social media. Um, we saw how it was used in a number of countries uh, during the Arab Spring uh, in 2011, 2012. Um, that was something that was used to get people to gather, to set meeting places. But of course, governments have gotten smart now and they've turned that around and are controlling media access. So oftentimes, recent, you know, in more recent decade, they're shutting down um, the media and people's access to the internet because they want their own narrative to be the one that prevails, or they're surveilling what people are actually saying um, and shutting down that ability to um, have a say, have a voice. So I think it's, um, I think, one of the problems is that, I mean, all foreign policy is inconsistent. I mean, it just is real politic. But I think we're seeing that more and more from countries around the world, but in particular from the United States, in how it is demonstrating um, its foreign policy in different countries. So we need to take a step back and have policies that work for the United States and not necessarily um, sort of contracting out our policies to other countries like France for West Africa 
or the Middle East for dealing with some of North Africa and, uh, um, and somewhat Central Africa, you know, Sudan. We have lead countries that are implicated in many of these wars. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do you have a country that is basically um, gaining something, even if the war stops, they're still in control of some of the mining, some of the gold, some of other, um, other precious metals, etc. But the people on the ground are getting little to nothing. Can I add a comment? Oh, please. Yeah. So I agree with all of that. And I think one of the things that this reminds me of in listening to this is there is this uh, unsolvable dilemma that you know, all countries face, really, uh, but you know, great powers like the United States. How can we be committed to advancing our national interest and committing to advancing democracy? Too often, they are not easily compatible, those two goals. And you know, if you, like, you know, I'm a firm believer in global democracy and human rights, and that should be you know, one of the leading consistent goals of a country and its national leaders. In my mind, that's going to lead to some trade-offs sometimes in things that are in your, your economic development interests. Um, but it's hard for political leaders to make that those decisions. They, 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 they will quite often compromise. We'll, we'll be allies with undemocratic states routinely because it's in our national political interest. There's a, you know, a sensitive zone that we need to make sure that our economic interests have access to those markets or we want this country to be an ally politically because of a global, a global or regional struggle government leaders will quite often let democracy suffer as a goal. We see it all the time, and, and we're not alone. I mean, you know, we're probably better than most, but it's hard to be a, a country that's a consistent leader on democracy when you're also trying to do what you think is necessary for your political and economic interests. And so that's a central, central dilemma. I wish we were more on the side of, of democracy more consistently, I wish that you know the Carter Center, I mean the Carter Center, the United States and others could do more to make that happen, but I'm also trying to be a realist and understand that politically it's just difficult. Yeah, and I, I would just add, I, I think part of the problem um, with democratic regimes, in, in quotes, is that these days especially, some people aren't so interested in governing, but they're interested in power. And so we're all, you know, talking about these issues that mean a lot to us, rights, democracy, rules-based order, that we violate a lot. Um, but then all of a sudden, but it's not okay for you to violate that rules-based order. Um, or for the competition over whose rules. Right. Um, and then lastly, I would say, where you have systems that, I mean, when I first started in the State Department, um, in the Office of the Legal Advisor, for the first 10 years of my career, change of government, change of leaders, change of parties, really the, the political situation didn't change. Our policies didn't move that significantly. You always would have a big issue that might come along, the opening of China, obviously it was before I was, long before I was in the um, But, you know, or changing our approach on uh, Vietnam or um, uh, um, Cuba. But by and large, not a whole lot changed at the policy level. So it almost didn't matter who was at the top. They had different approaches, perhaps, and different philosophies, but that tended to affect much more the domestic level. But when you are running in elections every four years, your policy really, as David said, it comes down to, well, we've got to make these you know, compromises, but it's not necessarily because they're in our best interests or real politic, it's domestic real politic. And um, if we do something like this, um, how is that going to be viewed? Not necessarily for elections, but we're in a financial cycle with appropriations and a money cycle 
that leads us to short-term planning and short-term thinking. And democracy, governance, um, the rule of law, human rights, these are long, long-term objectives and goals that are not solvable in four years. Let me, so I want to continue this thread and think about it um, in, in a, uh, thinking about it in terms of great powers and realignment, right? And so, you know, maybe one way of thinking about, uh, uh, given, you know, Susan, the way you've been talking about your history at state and, and what had been going on for a while before that is, you know, for a long time with under Cold War competition, there was, uh, it was the U.S. and its Democratic allies and the USSR and its non-democratic allies, right? And so we um, kind of managed uh, uh, the global democracies in that sense that we could, we could um, uh, um, uh, support democracies because they were our friends and uh, push against undemocratic regimes because they were uh, not our friends. Um, but now, since uh, we're kind of in this new phase of great power competition, in particular with um, China entering the scene so strongly and with Russia, um, so um, first, are there other countries vying for influence that we should be paying attention to? I'm wondering particularly about the future with uh, Africa and uh, with the Indian subcontinent. Um, and then, uh, you know, other countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the UAE, or Turkey, how do they fit in here? Um, is this a new era? Is there realignment? And how is that affecting democracy? I should leave that to my <laughs> State Department. <laughs> uh, respect. Former long ago State Department. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I don't know that I would say necessarily realignment, and I bristle at the great power competition language to be being used today. I don't really think that's exactly right. Um, but I think we also don't give other countries enough credit for when we make it all about China, <coughs> other countries are just operating without being seen. They're under the radar to us, not necessarily to anyone else. But uh, Turkey is a huge, huge um, competitor. And they are making their mark in lots of places, but it's going sort of unseen, unheard. Um, and that, I think, is quite dangerous. And then the, the, the other bit is uh, when we think about some of the deals that have been made recently that the U.S. was taken by surprise, well, you know, countries aren't sitting around waiting for the United States to make a move. And Africa's never been top of the list. Uh, you know, it only rises up when there's an issue. But right now, what's going on in Sudan, for instance, I mean, this has really serious global implications because Sudan is so large and the countries that it borders. And the war has been going on April, 5th, uh, April 15th will be the one year mark. Um, and the country is devastated. They're moving in the direction of famine. Um, it's not being talked about, but we have basically I don't want to say allowed because it's not allowing, but um, sort of sent out our policy to, ah, the UAE can handle this. Um, Saudi Arabia can handle these negotiations. But there are links between what Saudi Arabia is doing or what UAE is doing or what uh, Qatar is doing in different places, not just in Sudan. Mm -hmm. What's happening in Syria? What's happening in the Central African Republic? What are they doing in Libya? What are they doing in the Middle East, in you know, Israel, Palestine? Who has connections? So I think even the way that we divide countries or mm -hmm. regions, at least within the State Department, Africa is divided into Sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, 
you know, the Asian subcontinent, the Asian subcontinent versus, you know, it's a continent. Right. Um, and so I think we do ourselves a disservice when we pretend that there are no other spheres of influence and that it's only within their little sub-region of whichever continent that might be. Well, <laughs> I thought if, if I wanted to comment, I, I agree. I, um, could you say a little bit more, and maybe David also um, thinking about the Carter Center, but maybe maybe talking about Sudan in particular, but what are these externalities in terms of the health of democracy? If one country is struggling, how is that affecting other countries within the region? Well, I would say, um, Sudan is a particularly interesting case, and I know the Carter Center has been in Sudan for a long time, and southern Sudan before uh, South Sudan, southern Sudan seceded to become South Sudan. Um, it's interesting because it straddles, really, um, Africa and the Middle East. And the people themselves of Sudan are grappling with their identities mm -hmm. as are they yeah. Arab, are they Africans, they're Africans, they're Arabs. But we like to reduce things to simplistic, either good guy, bad guy, um, uh, Muslim, Christian. Right. It's, it's not that simple and it, it doesn't operate that way. And so we often get it wrong. <laughs> Because we don't understand and we don't, as the last panel said, we're not even teaching American history to Americans. How would we possibly learn about the history of other countries? And so, um, but the people of the country know. They know their history. I mean, again, we don't necessarily know our own history. But they know their history and they know what other countries have done to them or how they are perceived. We need to be much more in tune about what people on the ground are, are actually thinking. And a militaristic approach, which is what we have taken um, towards diplomacy in the last 10, 15, 20 years, it's not new, um, is helping us to get where we are. But the world is much more interconnected than it ever was. Social media is one way, but that works in, 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 both, you know, in both directions. So um, separating us out into, uh, it's important to recognize the individuality and the uniqueness of each country, but they also have connections to like the African Union. They're part of that, but they're also part of the Arab League. Um, mm -hmm. And there are dynamics within those bodies as well as between states. So these, David, I'm turning to you, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm going to kind of, so Susan was just talking about the political complexity and economic complexity, but, uh, but a little bit earlier in her remark, she was talking about social complexity and mm -hmm. that these people have these um, uh, very rich and complex identities, and those identities may spill across political borders. And, yeah. and it's part of that spillover, I imagine, that can really cause uh, maybe a decay of democracy in one country, have very real spillovers in others. And so I'm, I'm wondering to what extent, um, you know, we used to, Think about, I know when I was an undergraduate here, and I also forgot to give uh, Ambassador Page the shout out of, most importantly, being a Wolverine. Of, Go blue! <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, uh, you know, we talked about the domino theory, right? And you've, you've got to, uh, you can't let, because if one goes, then the rest go. But when we're, when we're building this kind of sense of the complexity of these societies that spill across political boundaries, we could also think about, ah, okay, we know we need to really shore up democracy here because it will help bolster democracy elsewhere. Or uh, if it fails, it can cause this cascade of failure. Sure. Does the Carter Center think in those terms? Yes, I mean, we, we certainly, we, we try to understand what's causing a decline in democracy, what are the challenges to good elections, what are the, the social and political forces that are, you know, that can be cited as things that are driving stuff, but we actually 
you know, we don't dwell on that. We don't study it in depth. We don't research it. There's plenty of people who are doing that. We tend to be focusing very specifically on, okay, now there's a question of will we observe elections in Sudan? Well, are we going to be invited? And then we'll, we'll do quickly an analysis of the issues there, but it's connected to that moment in time. Sometimes it's years that we're working on that particular country. So, but we're not, you know, doing the, the broader, deep reflection and analysis that places like the University of Michigan are. Look who's here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pause for a moment so we can all welcome fresh from the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Steve. You go ahead and take this seat. Um, I've already introduced you, and um, we're just in this, uh, you know, we're talking about democracy. Um, trying to maybe find some bright points, uh, but there's a lot of worry. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, you missed it, but there. I didn't miss it. <laughs> I actually uh, listened to the whole program on the way there. Uh, hey! Really? Yeah. Oh, right. so, uh, oh, wow. Uh, don't thank me. Thank the people in the back who are uh, doing the technology. Oh, but um, I did have a chance to listen to both of you, so thanks. Great. Oh, fabulous. All right. So yeah. then you heard um, that. Uh, uh, a few minutes ago, uh, Susan was talking about um, uh, worries about the media um, and uh, um, that uh, the media has uh, been controlled, uh, the messaging has been controlled, which is antithetical to a pluralistic society where people don't have access to a variety of information um, and a variety of ideas. And we can see that as maybe one symptom of many of moving away from a commitment to democratic norms. Um, so this free press, um, the free and transparent elections that the Carter Center is so dedicated to. Um, and uh, so do, are you seeing this as a trend? Uh, what, if so, what kinds of democratic norms most uh, worry you that they are decaying? Yeah. So. The information space is, uh, in general, is certainly one of the largest vulnerabilities of democratic societies now, and, and one of the places where the challenges to existing democracies is playing out uh, most acutely. Um, it's a, it's more than one issue. Uh, mm. The uh, you know the uh, singular uh, control of media outlets is is part of it possibly, but that's complemented in societies where there's a monopoly on the spread of information as well, so you don't have competing voices or competing sources. Um, but even in societies where there's completely unconstrained media, and, and, or at least the unconstrained flow of information, and I would certainly argue that's the case in our country, um, there are still huge vulnerabilities built into the system. You know, I, I'm, uh, I'm old enough to remember when we thought that the internet would be a democratizing factor. Mm -hmm. That we, in the late 1990s, and Susan mm -hmm. will remember this, we had the hubris uh, to, uh, to get rid of a, a department of the United States government called the United States Information mm -hmm. Agency because we judged it was no longer necessary because everyone around the world would be able at, the, at their fingertips to get the information that they needed to make what we considered to be the right decisions. And boy, were we wrong. Were we wrong? And now we see uh, disinformation, misinformation, and even uh, even selective uh, advocacy around specific information uh, that's used to polarize and divide, to misinform and to undermine democracies. And this is a real challenge in our societies. Uh, and we don't have an answer. Uh, the the Europeans just passed a. Uh, a, 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 a large regulatory action in the digital space that probably will be the inspiration of at least a, a debate here in the United States. I'm not sure if this will culminate in action. But we clearly have a challenge here and we don't have an answer. I would maybe just add to that um, and welcome. And um, Steve Began is also a Wolverine. Oh, we, um, we gave him that shout out before. We're claiming him. <laughs> Um, but I, I would add to the, on the information, misinformation side, um, one of the issues that the, um, the lack of 
our Congress, even when they have hearings with the media giants, uh, the Facebook, the, you know, um, all of these sources, our Congress is made up of such an elderly set of people that, and, and it's no disrespect. I mean, they've earned the right to be where they are and their age, but they don't necessarily understand this new technology or what my parents would have called that new math. Um, and, you know, and that's problematic as well because then understanding how this information spreads and what that technology is all about is even more difficult for the people who are supposed to make the laws that will regulate it uh, that much more difficult. And there's a lot of money and a lot of campaign contributions somewhere in that picture. <laughs> so, all right, um, let's, I want to think, we've brought up the United States, I want to get us back to the United States. Um, in President Biden's first speech at the State Department after he took office, he declared, democracy is back, multilateralism is back, is the U.S. setting Oh, that's the end of the quote. Now it's the question. Is the U.S. actually setting a good example for struggling democracies around the world? Steve. Well, <laughs> as, a, as a struggling democracy, uh, we should be inspiration to the struggling democracies because we're certainly struggling. You know, I, 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 uh, I think we, uh, in all seriousness, seriousness we are and will be a, an excellent model for other countries around the world. We are wrestling with our own issues right now. And you think about the eras in our society when we grappled with issues of such huge magnitude, Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, um, things that were uh, both showed the worst of the United States of America and the best of the United States of America. I am highly confident that the resilience of our democracy at, at the end of the day will prove to be an excellent example for countries around the world. But democracy is not easy. It's, it's messy, it's hard to, hard to preserve. And, um, and you know, as, as you all know, uh, we're in a period of democratic retreat around the world right now. Um, but uh, I do think we are a good example. Are every one of our policies and every one of our decisions? Of course not. Across the 200 and nearly 50 years of our country's history, um, there are many moments uh, like that, but uh, in, in the arc of history, I am absolutely uh, of the belief the United States in, in its model of democracy will continue to inspire countries around the world. Thank you for saying that. David. Um, I don't disagree completely, <laughs> but I do have a, maybe a, I, I tend to be an optimist and I would say that's my optimistic take, but there's part of me that is not so confident. I hope you are right, and I really want you to be right, but I am worried about the many countries in the, in the world and the United States. I wish I was as confident as you, but th that actually helps me feel better because you, you've worked in government, I've never worked in government, and you've worked in government, and I've never worked in government. Um, and so that actually does make me feel a little bit better because um, it's good to know that you are that confident. I, I've worked on the other side though too. Yeah, I'm on yeah. the board of Freedom House and in, in, in NED, National yeah. Democratic Party. And in Moscow in the 1990s, I was a field worker uh, working with Russian partners who were trying to build a democracy unbelievably in Russia and the, and the passions yeah. inside the Russian people for what they thought was democracy. And admittedly, they were coming off a very low base, but it was inspirational. That, that's, that's still there, um, mm. and that's still part of us too, David. Oh, I, I agree with that. I, I think that is part of us. I'm just a little less confident than you are, but I, I am inspired by your confidence, honestly. Glad to be of assistance. <laughs> I, I think I would, I would add, importantly, the comment that you just made, which was back in the 1990s, working with local people on the ground, and that's something we don't do very well is we often, oftentimes have this top-down approach, including at our embassies, which obviously I've served in. Um, we deal with the same group of, you know, that top flight, educated, uh, people who speak our language, 
um, and they are the ones who are you know trained over and over and over again. But I'd like to see that commitment to localization that we mm -hmm. talk about actually used more and more in reality and in practice. And just remembering that democracy is fragile. And I'm sure all of us have written, I mean, I've written op-eds about the fragility of democracy. And, you know, presidents have talked about the fact that, you know, the rights may be defined, but they're not self-enforcing. We have to constantly renew our efforts and admitting that our country isn't perfect. And that's where I think diplomats on the ground are so important by admitting, yes, we have made a number of mistakes. We continue to make mistakes, but we're constantly trying to become that better nation. And I think that's important. And so we do have some questions, and if you have a question, go ahead and, and submit it. Um, but before we turn to the audience questions, I want to just ask you one last time. You've already started to talk about whether you're optimistic or pessimistic in particular about the U.S., but Susan just got us to thinking about what, in particular, about what, what uh, through the State Department, what we can do in terms of the U.S. foreign policy to bolster democracy's health elsewhere. Um, and does that make you optimistic or pessimistic about democracy's future? That is, I'm asking you to peer into your crystal ball and give us a sense of uh, by the year's end, such an important year for democracy, where will we feel like we're more worried or like we're bouncing back? I will feel more worried, I believe, um, because I don't think that our policies are moving away from militarization. I think we are militarizing even more our foreign policy than less. Um, I will say that um, before the 2020 election, my view was if we got through that election in a, you know, a decent place, that I was going to feel a lot more optimistic about the future. And what I felt was, we got through that election, but I don't think we're out of the woods. And I think I'm, my suspicion now, my strong sense is that we won't be out of the woods after the next elections, no matter what. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm pessimistic, but it means that I'm worried. So I, I, I'll say a word about the US, but let me, let me start globally. The, um, one of the, uh, one of the uh, metrics that I look to to understand trends in global democracy is, is uh, and there are a few out there, but one is uh, produced by an organization called Freedom House, a human rights organization based in Washington, D.C., in New York. It, uh, it annually uh, releases a report called uh, Freedom in the World, and they, they go globally uh, across uh, all countries and, and rate them on an index of, of democratic freedoms, liberties, respect for um, for pluralism in their societies, and uh, and they reflect what I think many social scientists will tell you, which is that uh, there's a little bit of debate about when, but we're approximately in the 18th year of a steady decline in the number of democracies around the world. So we peaked around 2007, 2008. And there's been a steady decline in what is objectively measured as democratic governments, democratic nations. And so I suppose that the good news is it, it, this isn't a problem that just started. The bad news is it's been going for 18 years. We, we are talking about it today, but we have, there are many of us who work on these issues have been concerned about this for some time. The, um, uh, we have seen democracies uh, backslide. Uh, but we've also seen them come back. And so mm -hmm. one very important observation is democracy is resilient. Um, in, we just saw a, 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 an election in Turkey, a country in which many people were worried about uh, the democratic direction in Turkey, but the opposition just, uh, just won a, a landslide election in Turkey. And, and that doesn't undermine the concerns that you, one might have had about a country like Turkey in, in uh, recent years. But it also validates having a general confidence and faith in democracy as long as constitutional order can be preserved. And, and that's very important because when an authoritarian or dictator completely abolishes the constitutional order, like we see, for example, in Russia, 
there's no chance for a competitive election. That just mm -hmm. I, I won't I won't enumerate all the ways that someone like Vladimir Putin can can deprive his people of democracy while still having a vote. Incidentally, as mm -hmm. as I think we started to call an election like activity, but not an election. <laughs> um, the um, but uh, democracy is resilient in, in many places in the world. Brazil is another example that's been cited uh, uh, recently. And you know, it, does, it doesn't mean that there was a horrible government and it's been succeeded by a perfect government, but the trend lines can be better. And so uh, I, I do think we will, we will see this around the world. It'll be nothing like what many of us who are uh, in our middle age or older remember from the 1980s and the 1990s, where we saw the, the uh, end of civil wars in Central America mm -hmm. and the birth of new democracies, where we saw the collapse of communism in the Warsaw Pact countries and then the collapse of the Soviet Union, where we saw the fall of the apartheid system in South Africa and Nelson Mandela elected to be the president. We saw Chinese students protesting in the main square of their capital, demanding democratic freedoms, and so on and so on and so on. It's not going to be like that. It's going to be more of a grind and more of a fight and one that that uh, we Americans who are devoted to democracy have to work in partnership with people in those countries, not telling them how to run their, their countries, not preaching the virtues of democracy, but rolling up our sleeves and working with them to build the fundamentals of a pluralistic society, of strong civil societies, of, of uh, good political organization, and, and ultimately of free and fair elections. In the United States, um, you know, uh, we all feel it. So uh, I, I'm not going to make uh, David feel any more optimistic. Uh, <laughs> uh, we know that there's uh, there's a, a pretty negative vibe out there in our system right now. And uh, I I do I won't I won't restate my my devotion of faith to the the things working out in the end. But what I'll say this is, it's up to us. This is not them is going to fix this one. We're not going to have uh, others come in here and, and, and tell us uh, how it gets better. We all have to play our role as citizens, as political activists. Um, we, have to, we, have to, we have to invest in the system. And, and if we check out, uh, then we are going to get the worst outcome. I'd like to turn things over now to take your questions, but asked by my two colleagues here. Um, uh, Nayeb and Sheree. Thank you so much. Um, can you all hear me? Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much, Ambassador Page, um, Dr. Carroll, Mr. Vegan, and Dr. Bednar for this excellent discussion. Um, like Dr. Bednar introduced, uh, I'm Nayab Ali. I'm the Assistant Program Manager for Visa Diplomacy Center. And with me here today is uh, Sharif el Maki, who is one of our MPP graduating students this year. Um, we will be moderating the audience questions. So if you have anything, please use the QR code placed on your desks. And um, yeah, we'll take it from there. Our first question today is, how responsible is the U.S. foreign policy for the democratic backsliding that has, that has been seen in the recent years? As an example, the U.S. foreign policy during the Arab Spring saw nascent democracies go unsupported and eventually succumb to counter-revolutions. Additionally, US, U.S. policies in the Middle East played a hand in the European refugee crisis, which fueled the rise of far-right parties across the EU. I defer to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, I'll start. I mean, I think that, um, I don't know if I would say responsible, but um, yes, I mean, we certainly play a role. And we often will say at an official level that we support democratic change, that we support um, these, you know, uh, students or whoever is trying to get their governments to move forward. But the US is like any government. We don't like change. And we like what we think of as stability, even when that stability is not necessarily terribly democratic. Um, so yes, I think, but it, it's also very hard for governments to support groups that are kind of amorphous. Our own political system is basically a two-party presidential system. Other governments around the world are multi-parties in their parliaments, a parliamentary system which operates differently. 
And so they are more accustomed to having to negotiate and discuss, you know, compromises. I, I don't think that we are as, as accustomed to doing that. So um, we like to back who we think is going to be a winner. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, again, I think the way that our society has sort of grown up. Um, but it's problematic when you look at different case studies. Well, why did we support this one but not that one? And um, we don't always take a similar stance. You know, I, I uh, just add, I agree with um, with what Susan said, what Ambassador Page said that Susan's th th fine. this is a this is a struggle for us in U.S. foreign policy, and it's partially in, informed by uh, what David spoke up, spoke to earlier when I was in the car, uh, the, the, trying to balance our interests versus our our, uh, our values, and but also uh, in in different readings of our own history in the role we should play. And so the, the underlying premise of the question isn't isn't exactly right because the United States did intervene in several places during the Arab Spring. The United States and NATO forces toppled uh, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya and the, the U.S. pulling support out from um, uh, from Hosni Mubarak was absolutely the critical blow in him ultimately falling in uh, and, and surrendering the country to, to democratic elections. Um, in the case of Syria, the United States provided military assistance and even has troops to this day in Syria uh, uh, in support of what started as a truly spectacular uprising of democratic voices in Syria but now has devolved into an ugly uh, inter-Nicene war uh, that uh, has both uh, uh, a extremist overtones as well as the dictatorial tendencies of, of the of the leader of, of Syria itself. And so it's not we've been in, uh, indifferent to these or even uh, standoffish. The, ch the challenge we've had is, is though uh, more formidable, is follow through. So um, when you topple a leader like Muammar Gaddafi in a country that's a complex mix of, of, of tribal loyalties and, and, and regional interests, and then, by the way, you throw, uh, throw in there for good measure huge, uh, huge uh, reserves of gas and oil. Um, to, to walk away from that after you topple a dictator like Gaddafi is an invitation for the kind of ugly civil war that we saw. Uh, and, and probably our reticence to be more involved in Syria allowed that to devolve into the brutal conflict it became. But that reservation was, was guided by a president who had seen the United States go into Iraq and topple a government in Iraq and, the, and, the, and the, 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 the terrible lessons that we learned from that experience were applied to Syria and, and led to some reservation to go any further. So um, I would say that uh, uh, you know, there's, a, there's a lot of different factors here, but I think follow through is actually the one that the United States probably has, has, has failed most. Could, could I add just a little tiny bit? I don't completely agree with the Libya example because that was exceeding what NATO was actually supposed to do and I think that that drove a lot of the issues that are, um, are apparent right now which includes massive refugees and then the EU also basically giving a green light to Turkey, we'll sign this deal, keep those people within your borders so that they don't come to Europe. I mean, those are some of the ramifications, and the um, UN Re Security Council resolutions had nothing to say. It was to protect the population, not to topple Gaddafi. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that one is a little bit more complicated for my way of thinking and the negative consequence of involvement, because that then stopped a Security Council resolution to help the Syrian people because of what we did that exceeded what we were supposed to do, not just the U.S., but um, what we were supposed to do in Libya. So we've talked a little bit about doing the work and about the follow through and kind of what comes after some of these changes. And so this question is about um, how specifically can the U.S better its public diplomacy engagement in building civil society throughout the world? And what role can U.S. agencies like USAID, Peace Corps, et cetera, play in that goal moving forward? And I think this is supposed to be more forward-facing, visionary, like what needs to change? Well, we already do a lot, Sharif. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, it's, um, 
it is a significant pillar of, of our foreign policy is to, to, to help those in societies seeking to uh, build, the, build or sustain their democracies, and, and so we do. Um, probably where we fall shorter is addressing all the other social ills that make it so hard uh, for people to, to make the democratic choice that I think left to their own cho uh, left to themselves they would make when they when you know when they're struggling to survive and so we're at, it, it's kind of probably passing the, bypassing the question but I I wish we were doing much much more uh, to help societies struggling uh, with uh, demographic and and uh, economic and in and, and humanitarian issues, I think we would have a lot more success with our democracy programs. David. Shall I? Yeah. yeah. So um, I, I agree with everything Stephen has said. I think where I would maybe shift emphasis a little bit is, um, you know, it kind of goes back to that, that original tension between our interests and our values. And, you know, how I think it's almost an uh, irreconcilable dilemma. You can't consistently always pursue both your values and your interests. Um, and I think there's some countries where it's just going to be very hard for us in, in instances around the world to, to really think we're going to be able to have a, a sustainable long-term interest that we are going to impact through our engagement. I mean, I think we can when we should try where we can, but there's so much that we can't really control. There's so many other forces that are affecting what's happening in other countries. So it's, it's, a, it's just another, in my view, a very difficult tension because there's so many places that would benefit from U.S. engagement that we could try to push in the right direction. But there's so many factors in every single country that are also going to be at play that you quite often find, oh, we can't really control what's happening in this country. There's all these other factors that are contributing it. And if we want to stay engaged and can continue to shape events, we've got to do a whole lot more. And you know what? We don't have the public support to do all this. So we, we quite often get into those situations where it's very, very difficult. And I'm not recommending anything in particular, just trying to be acknowledging how difficult it is to have a long-term, sustained, serious foreign policy engagement support to countries that is also going to be kind of consistent with our values. It's just hard. It's just hard. Yeah, I would only add that um, I think that, well, two things. One, um, the U.S. government doesn't put a lot of money behind these programs, and that's just reality. So. Yes, we care about them. We care about democracy support, uh, good governance, um, human rights, but the monetary value to those programs is a complete drop in the bucket. Yeah. And um, so that's one. The second thing, though, is the organizations that do really good work working at the local level. And I'm a disclaimer, I am on the board of trustees of the Carter Center. So, um, but getting down to the grassroots, working with people who are, as Steve said, doing the work. They're on the ground forming organizations that are doing local domestic election monitoring. They're working with their own political party systems, trying to make it better or local human rights groups. Information is so important. Those are things that groups like, uh, organizations like the Carter Center, the National uh, uh, Endowment, Endowment for, for Democracy. I mean, what the NED is doing is incredible. They don't have offices on the ground. They're working directly to support local entities making a difference on the ground. That's a model that we should be replicating at you know, a hundredfold, because that is exactly what people want: is the ability to change their own future, and it doesn't have to even be with a lot of money. But that's those are the kinds of things that the NED is doing, and there are many more. That's, those are just a couple of examples. Thank you. 
Um, more than 50 countries are expected to hold elections, uh, national elections in 2024. Voters across the world are expressing fears about immigration, and alongside this nationalism, populism is also becoming increasingly common. India, specifically, is the largest democracy in the world, but under the Modi, Modi administration, there are increasing crackdowns on Muslims and Islamic culture, mm -hmm. even down to a zoo receiving a court order to rename or separate two lines sharing an enclosure together. If this trend continues, do you think in the rising tide of religious intolerance, there is the beginning of a harmful snowballing of anti-democratic sentiment that could lead to a further consolidation of executive power? To, was that just about India, the, the way the question was framed? Or? Um, India, yeah. it's an example. Okay. You want to start? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, my problem in this context is I'm going to give a lot of general, vague, unclear answers because I think that's the best ref reflection of, in my assessment, uh, of where we are. And um, not, how, what was the point, what was the very end of that question? Can, can you say it again? If this trend continues, do you think in the rising tide of religious intolerance, there yeah. is the beginning of a harmful snowballing of anti-democratic sentiment that could lead to a further consolidation of executive power? I mean, yes, I think that could be a, a factor. But again, I think there's so many other factors that I wouldn't put my finger on any single one. And then, But what I would add one that we haven't talked about explicitly in this context, but I know that it's been discussed in the previous sessions and days, climate change is making everything harder. You know, the population pressures and the you know, people needing to move to another country and you know, run, running into borders and running into challenges on their lives. You know, all the problems that we've talked about yet today so far are going to be that much harder, well, not all of them that much harder, but it's going to be an additional complicating factor. And I would say too that um, on the climate change front, there are only very specific reasons that people are allowed to claim refugee status. And climate change moving because you are being forced to move because of the climate is not one of them. And while uh, there's absolutely zero, there should be zero tolerance for some of the harsh racist or populist rhetoric that we hear in politics today around the world, um, this massive migration flow is yet another thing that's straining the systems of democracy. Sure. It's, it, uh, you know, Susan talked a little bit about this before. It challenges people's notions of, of their own economics and economy. Uh, it challenges people's identities. Uh, not that we shouldn't be able to overcome those kind of concerns or resentments that arise in people, but when the system is overloaded, you know, we have, we have. Uh, such a surge of people moving in the world right now that it's exacerbating a lot of social ills in terms of humanitarian support, so, uh, social support from governments that are creating public policy challenges uh, in, in, frankly, in both democratic and undemocratic societies. Um, and this, uh, you know, uh, there's no unified theory to the case here. David's absolutely right. There's a complex set of issues. I, th I feel like we're responding to the to the symptoms when we're talking about controlling immigration or immigration reform or whatever, you know, when you you look at a, a, a region like Latin America, it's just begging for help in governance and in, in as developing its democracy in, in a law-based, you know, the development of law-based uh, societies. It's, uh, and it, until, we, until we figure out how to get our arms around that and commit the resources to do so, you know, we're just, we're just trying to plug the leak by trying to stop these massive refugee flows. In Syria, the failure to, to, to deal with that conflict early on led to a massive migration flow, mm -hmm. as, as Susan said, that created tensions in, in, in Europe yeah. that we still are seeing the ramifications of today in, 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 in European elections. And um, in Venezuela, another situation, another uh, place where uh, we, we've had a global policy failure. I won't lay this entirely at the feet of the United States. Five million refugees from Venezuela. There were more refugees from Venezuela than there were from Syria mm -hmm. uh, during that period. And not surprisingly, a lot of them are showing up at the United States in search of 
livelihood for themselves and their families. So uh, and, and I, I feel like we have to stop dealing with the symptoms and we have to really start uh, getting at the root causes. I think we have time for one last question. Sounds good. Um, I think we have a pretty good one to send everyone off with uh, your expert advice. So we had a very robust discussion about some of the lack of public support for democracies. We have a wide variety of aspirational policy professionals and interested audience members here. And what would you suggest concretely that we do beyond basic civic engagement to foster and support our democracies in a productive way? And keep in mind, we also have people from any nationalities here. So what can be translatable? Um, very quickly, uh, I think understanding the context and um, getting involved. Yeah, I, I hate to just say I agree and say the same thing, but I'm going to agree with both Susan and Stephen and say that this is, you know, getting involved, doing something is really the, the most important thing. And, and trying to do it in an, as formed way as possible is really the only thing that we can do, and it's going to be <laughs> critical to success. And it can be, it can, the good thing is, it can take a whole wide variety of forms. And so you can find from your own perspective in life what you know, what you're comfortable with, what you want to contribute, where you have an interest or a connection. There's something you can do. And so, you know, don't feel like, well, you know, I can't do this one thing that people have highlighted. Even small things, and just to really go back to what, what you said earlier, it's, it's going to require everybody to do something. And you can do more than you think. So I think that's the challenge I would leave with you is you know, do something. For me, um, the, uh, there's, the, there's the systems of democracy, uh, elections. And, and, well, there's the underpinnings, pluralism and, uh, and a free, free media and a free society. There's the systems, elections uh, being uh, central among them. There are the institutions that defend our democracy. Um, our unique set is a, a separate court, Congress and, and uh, executive. But um, I, I have a growing fear that none of it works without a democratic culture. And that's where we all can also very specifically contribute is in civility and informed uh, discourse. And, and, uh, and that doesn't mean no passion, and that doesn't mean surrendering your principles. Uh, it means uh, working with others in a democratic manner. And I think that's the, that's the part of our system that I most worry has frayed. And I actually wonder if the institutions or the processes function or matter if we lose the, the, the democratic culture that makes it all come together. For sure. Thank you all so much. Yeah, and just join me in thanking uh, this spectacular panel. So sorry I was late. And thank you, Jenna, for moderating. Uh. <laughs> With pleasure. All right, thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.